<clears throat> as we look into the text today, um, we see uh, the title, The Most Excellent Way. That is how uh, Paul is bringing us to focus on the way we live uh, uh, for, for Christ and how we live that out. There's a way to do uh, more than we have done. There's a way to change us more than we have been. There's a way to honor Christ and be pleasing to Him more than we have. And it is uh, our joy that uh, He is uh, leading us to see the, this truth and to be able to live uh, out the truth uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we uh, are given an opportunity that if we listen well and uh, submit to the truth that's given to us today, we will see uh, excellence in the way that we live our Christian life. Excellent means, uh, you know, pleasing, uh, best, wonderful, uh, awesome, and we want to have those uh, adjectives <coughs> describing our walk before the Lord. So let's pray that uh, it is not just uh, something that we just hear, but something that will be uh, transformed uh, and evident in our life. Lord, we honor your word. We honor the Holy Spirit who speak the word to our heart and use the revelation in the text to show us our Christ who is the word, displaying, manifesting, explaining the Father to us. Help us to listen well, help us to obey well and commit to the truth to honor you. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see in the outline uh, the context of love in the church, the indispensability of love in ministry, the qualities of love, and the eternal nature of love. So the anchor that we will uh, go through the text in the next few weeks to uh, uh, discover and to learn of uh, this uh, excellent way to live out the gospel, to live out the life of Christ in our, in our midst. But I would like to take some time uh, to introduce the context, as we say, the context of love in the church, because I think it uh, will establish a new understanding or a deeper understanding for us how to live it out as we look into love as required for our function as a church and love required for our purpose together as a church. As you will notice that we began our reading uh, in 1231 uh, and not uh, 13, uh, the verse uh, 1 uh, of chapter 13 as normal, as we normal practice. Uh, chapter 13 is by far the most eloquent, the most uh, exquisite, the most profound description of love. Um, it is a classic, it's a masterpiece uh, in terms of literature, um, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a really a deep presentation of spiritual insights uh, on love. And if we read the description of love here in this chapter, and then go back to uh, some of the, you know, the contemporary sayings in our time, everything else seemed to be uh, pretty uh, childlike, a uh, child play, yeah, even uh, the familiar stuff that we have. So, for example, when uh, uh, we hear about love, it's defined love is never to have to say you're sorry. Uh, I think that's uh, the famous book and movie love story state that. Uh, uh, some poem saying that love is dying a little bit inside. Uh, uh, love is blue, love is blind, all kind of description of love. But uh, when we look into uh, the, the reality of love and definition of love, there's uh, nowhere uh, that can come close uh, to this passage as uh, unparalleled and unequal um, in uh, the profound truth that it's uh, uh, delivered to us. At so many levels, uh, it stands by itself. Uh, you just cannot compare this passage to anything else uh, produced even by the best of men. But that's also where we make mistakes. Uh, that's uh, where uh, we have uh, uh, misused and uh, misunderstood this wonderful and profound passage. Um, so we want to look at uh, the normal context and uh, establish how we must uh, approach this text and how we must uh, uh, discover or uh, rediscover uh, the channel where this text can live uh, in our life and in uh, our uh, relationship with God and with one another. Uh, because uh, the problem is uh, most of the time 
the, the chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is treated as a masterpiece, but by itself. And uh, yeah, in a way we can understand that. It is uh, well deserved to stand tall by itself because the theme of love is so central and so important in Christian living that uh, we see chapter 13 pops up in different ways, in different uh, settings. And the most uh, popular uh, context is in a wedding ceremony. It seems, uh, you know, uh, most fitting there according to our, uh, um, uh, the way we take it. Uh, we find uh, chapter 13 also as a decoration. Uh, it's a frame, uh, verses of it framed and hung on the wall. Uh, both something nice to look at and something good to think about. Uh, you can find that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, decoration uh, in, uh, the, the, uh, in most Christian bookstores. Uh, but what we do is uh, that we go buy this passage in a good, nice frame and give it as present to newlywed couples and uh, give our best wishes for the family and it's a nice spiritual thing to do. So the, the, the immediate re result of, uh, uh, of this uh, truth that chapter 13 uh, presents, uh, it is used to, uh, to, uh, for us as a kind of an abstract um, definition of love. A very profound theme uh, to meditate upon um, uh, for the development and the even uh, uh, of our individual character, what we ought to be and what we ought to do. Uh, and uh, even in the flow of the letter uh, to the Church of Corinth, uh, we find it as a relief because uh, we've been deep into the instruction, pretty intense, by the Apostle Paul teaching us on how to solve problems, how to serve, how to live out the spiritual gift that's given to us. And it's, it's sort of like a fresh air uh, kind of you know, you've been going deep in the water, and now you pop up for, for breath, and you say, at least something positive, at least something that uh, I can just uh, relax and, and, and uh, kind of be uplifted uh, by the truth and the grandeur of, uh, of the topic here. So we imagine that Paul must be very happy when uh, the Holy Spirit carried him along in inspiration to pen these magnificent words uh, with great beauty. Um, but uh, because of that contrast, as I mentioned, uh, chapter 13 uh, on love is often taken out of context as a thesis by itself and treated as a, uh, independent from the rest, uh, as an abstract art and uh, very, ple very pleasing to the eyes and to the ears, but uh, very, uh, uh, not very useful in life. Uh, so uh, that's why we have to read uh, from uh, uh, the 1231. Um, the proper understanding of this passage has to take into account the proper context of uh, the intent of the author. Uh, in a certain way, the, uh, the love uh, topic is at the heart of the gospel message, and so we tend to kind of apply it everywhere, plug it in everything. However, we cannot properly apply the text if we don't know the aim of the passage or the intent of the author. Uh, and this masterpiece cannot be properly understood apart from uh, its setting and background. Uh, its message uh, as an integral part uh, of what Paul has said before and said after, uh, the full impact and the full beauty uh, will be lost in isolation. Uh, so we must return to the original focus of uh, chapter 13. We want to understand the passage in its uh, original context uh, and uh, in the frame of thoughts and in the mindset that Paul is coming from and the issues is, is he is dealing with, uh, with the church in uh, Corinth uh, as well as the church uh, in Anaheim. So that's why we, uh, we, uh, we uh, note the context by uh, looking at verse 31 in chapter 12. But eagerly desire the greater gifts and now I will show you the most excellent way. Um, now, I'll just say something that's so obvious uh, uh, that uh, you may say, why spend the time? But uh, we just read the chapter th 13 of the book, uh, uh, in the book uh, called First Corinthians. It is a letter the Apostle Paul uh, sent to the church at Corinth. 
And in uh, this letter, Paul is dealing with many issues and many problems in the church, teaching believers to live properly in the faith, uh, uh, in Christ, in the grace that they have received at the cross. And um, a very simple observation is that we have come to chapter 13 because we have uh, learned through chapter 12, and uh, next we will go to chapter 13. So very simple, um, but uh, somehow uh, many of us have lost uh, that connection or devote very little or no attention uh, to this, uh, uh, this flow. Because the whole chapter of uh, 13, uh, 12, 13, and 14 is on the same topic, spiritual gifts. And spiritual gift can be generally defined as the channels that God has chosen to work in the lives of his people uh, through the community of faith, which is the church, uh, which is the body of Christ, to accomplish uh, the purposes of his eternal kingdom uh, and the transformation toward Christ-likeness uh, in the life of his people. So we have the primary context uh, of uh, the chapter uh, 12, 13, 14, uh, as uh, the life in the church, uh, the primary context of chapter 13 is in connection to how uh, we live together in the local church and, uh, and uh, uh, with connection and uh, with the exercise of uh, spiritual gifts. So we say that the life in the body of Christ, the life in service and ministry, the life in the local church, is uh, the context of how we must understand chapter 13. And uh, notice that this is where love is defined. Uh, if we uh, lose sight of this significant factor, um, then uh, we will lose uh, the real focus of what Paul is talking about. The most profound explanation of love is given in the context of ministry service, in the life of God's people, serving him and carry out his purpose in the local church. So if we understand love uh, according to chapter 13, uh, we have to uh, bring ourselves in that context and place our understanding in connection uh, to uh, uh, the reality of how we live out in that context in our life. Uh, it is the context of ministry service. It is in connection to the life of God's people in the church, in the local church, uh, serving him and carry out his purpose. Uh, for the church and for the individual members in the church. So I want to emphasize this foundation because uh, if we fail at the primary context of this principle where love is learned, love is developed, learned, uh, love is experienced in the service of God in the life and the relationship with the local church, we will fail everywhere else in our application of this truth of love. You know, so we attempt to take that into a family and uh, mix with some romantic love and mix it with some spiritual um, uh, connotation, frame it in the wall of our house uh, and read that uh, to our children. Uh, but yet, if we don't connect to the life of the church and serve uh, in the primary arena where this love is developed, where this love is experienced, where this love can mature, uh, even in our home, uh, it uh, won't find uh, the anchor and, uh, and the footing necessary to, uh, to uh, live out in that context. Uh, so uh, so uh, we must understand this focus and make sure that the context is clear for us. Um, maybe to, to, to show uh, this, uh, let me just have you think about a sandwich. Uh, I mean, it's a wrong time to talk about lunch. Uh, you may be hungry, and then that's all you think about from now on, and it doesn't matter what I say. So that may be my mistake, but uh, well, uh, being hungry uh, and uh, set aside, uh, I want to think of the sandwich because, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the two ones and uh, the meat in, in between. Because I want to show that uh, in chapter 12, Paul talking about spiritual gift. You look at uh, chapter 12, verse 1, he said, now about spiritual gift, brothers. Uh, I do not want you to be uh, ignorant. So the topic uh, Paul will be teaching on and what he's uh, focusing on is a spiritual gift. And in chapter 12, Paul discussed the gift given by the Holy Spirit, teach uh, every believer who must use uh, the spiritual gift to serve the community of faith, and each member of the body connect to the body 
uh, and to other members, and we learned this uh, for the last few months. Um, so we cannot escape uh, the connection that it is in the context of church, of spiritual gifts, of uh, service, of exercising the provision of the Holy Spirit. Now you go to the other side of chapter uh, the 13, which is chapter 14, and look at verse 1. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. So Paul is continuing the same uh, flow of thought, the same theme. The discussion and teaching is uh, ongoing on the spiritual gift. And uh, chapter 14 lay down the rule of exercising the gift. So uh, the, the chapter 12 explaining uh, what are the different gifts, uh, showing the relationship in the church as the body of Christ uh, and uh, how the gifts are placed and uh, assigned and, uh, and uh, 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 each, each member has responsibility to carry it out, whether they like it or not, a, a few um, you know, wonderful uh, or not so wonderful, uh, but um, that is where the gifts are assigned. And then in uh, chapter 14, it's talking about the order to carry it out. You, you have to go, uh, carry the, the gift in order, not in chaos uh, uh, situation. There's a, a manner that you should live out your gift. And then uh, Paul said, uh, uh, but uh, in, in the middle of that, he, 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 he kind of stopped and he said, uh, I want you to understand the, the essential matter that makes everything work. Uh, and that is the, the excellent way that he's uh, talking about here, that is love. So love is introduced in the context of spiritual gift. It is defined in terms of ministry uh, relationship. The primary application of love is in the church and in the spiritual service. So although it may seem less romantic and less mysterious or less profound, uh, we need to make connection at this level. So when we read uh, love is patient, love is kind, Love is not jealous, love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act in, uh, unbecomingly, does not seek his own, does not provoke, does not take into account the wrong suffer, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We will take time to go down that. But you can uh, read this in and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, without the connection to the church, then nothing will work. Because the Paul said that is where you must understand and uh, to apply that first um, uh, before you carry it out to the next context where it applies. So the context of love in the church, uh, let's look at the first one, is that love is required for our function. Uh, love is required for our function in the body of Christ the church. And just as I mentioned, Love is, uh, in this wonderful chapter, is defined in the context of spiritual service in the local church, in the lives of people who learn and develop their spiritual gift to serve the glory of God in his kingdom. And note this, and in their service, God develops them into loving people, uh, Christ-like people who possess true love. Uh, so, uh, so love uh, is given or developed or uh, 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 become reality uh, in the lives of God's people when they serve through the ministry of the church and, uh, and, uh, and carry out the function that God has assigned each and every one. So uh, in their service, God will develop them, uh, us, uh, into loving people, uh, people who possess uh, the true love and the Christ-like love that the uh, scripture describes. Um, so immediately some will ask them then, uh, are you implying that if we don't serve in the church, if we don't exercise our gift, if we don't lo uh, then we don't love, then we're not loving people. Uh, you know, if I want people to like me, I'll uh, find a way to dance around that question, or uh, maybe smart enough not to raise it in the first place. But I want you to think through with me. Uh, let's ask a few questions. Can I be a loving person in a biblical sense, uh, in connection to this context, if the greatest concern I have is me, myself, and mine? If the focus of my effort in life is to secure for me and my family a nice life based on middle class uh, American values, you know, a nice home, a nice car, uh, two and a half kids, and a retirement portfolio that is sufficient, 
and all that. Uh, if, if that is my main focus in life, can I be called a loving person? Can it be said that I'm a loving person like Jesus Christ if my time and money and my resources and my opportunities matter, uh, make a little impact in the lives of those around me for the kingdom, move uh, uh, just a few, uh, very few souls toward the heaven and influence no one for eternity? Can it be said biblically that I am a loving person? If ministry is defined as effort on behalf of others for their benefit, uh, in Christ, uh, and it is a good definition there if you understand that effort on behalf of others for their benefits in Christ. Uh, can it be said uh, of you and me that we are loving people if uh, our lives, in our lives there is little evidence of effort on behalf of others for their benefits? Uh, no, let's be frank, uh, you cannot be loving people without this connection. The best it may be said of us, perhaps, is that we are pretty nice people, but not loving people, not useful Christians, as the Bible defines it. So let me just uh, think with you on this uh, concept of uh, nice people. Um, I'm kind of going around a little bit, but I want to establish the connection because I think uh, we have treated this uh, chapter so out of context, it make, uh, it make real effort to re-establish the connection so we can apply it into our life. The world is full of nice people. I mean, I used to work uh, uh, in the industry and I spent almost 20 years with optical research and six years with Toyota. And I worked with many nice and helpful people uh, in, the, in, the, in the industry uh, out there in the midst of, of uh, the flows and ebb and flow of life in, in the world. And uh, we spent many uh, years in the church, and I must also say, the church is full of nice people. Uh, most people in the church are nice, and they're kind in their own ways. So you can turn to your next person and say, you're pretty nice. Uh, and uh, you can say that without, without lying, and because it's, uh, it's uh, true for the most place. But love is another story. Uh, we, uh, uh, for the most part, uh, confuse ni niceness with love uh, and nice people with loving people. We think ourselves as nice people uh, and often we would be right, but then we come to the conclusion we are nice, therefore we are loving, which is not true. Uh, love is another story. Love is defined uh, not arbitrarily without context. Love is defined biblically in connection to a life of service and in the context of people working together in the service of Christ. Uh, I wonder if you remember my friend Steve. I mentioned that, the independent, self-sufficient roofer who lived on chocolate milk and Twinkies uh, and who loved to disappear in the woods uh, uh, just by himself. And he's a very nice person. Fun to be with, helpful when he's around. Yet, can we say a person who lived like that is a loving person? No, not in, in that way. Um, so when the church is full of nice people, full of Steve's, who uh, nice to be with and uh, fun to share a few things, but uh, not loving, then we have a real big problem. Uh, when, when the church is full of Steve's, uh, nice people, that's not a compliment. It's actually a, tra a, tra a tragedy. A, a, a tragedy, uh, because Steve of the church cannot build the church, uh, a minister to others, but they are full of illusion that they could. Uh, more than uh, uh, given an illusion, they themselves suffer the illusion that they being nice can make a difference uh, for the church. No, it takes more than nice guys uh, to bring, to build, to serve. It takes people transformed by the love of Christ. And that transformation happens in living with the church together in service of the church and uh, being uh, functioning in the assigned place God put you in the church. We uh, by now are very familiar with Ephesians 4, but let me just read again from verse uh, 15 to 16. And note the context of love and the requirement of love in the way the, the church function. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, 
from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by the, what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of its individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So, uh, so uh, in love, uh, each part does it work in love, the body grows in love, uh, builds itself up in love, and that's the point. Love is required for our function, and love is required for the spiritual gift to work. So here we see Paul said that love is the prerequisite for, exercise, uh, for the exercise of spiritual gift. Love is the way that makes the spiritual connection work. And here is a distinction that we must make. Paul is not calling love uh, a spiritual gift, even though love comes from God. The Paul is making love a prerequisite for spiritual gift, uh, the life in, uh, in the church and the life that is useful for God. And this is important to understand, he said, but eagerly desire uh, the greater gifts, and now I'm, I will show you the most excellent way. Now the, the, uh, the, the, the word here, eagerly desire, is a very strong word. It's actually the word jealous, uh, uh, eagerly desire for greater gift. Uh, uh, he put in uh, the, 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 uh, the verb in such a way that it can be read as a command, which is uh, imperative, uh, or a description of fact, which is indicative. So the verb may mean to desire strongly and to be jealously seeking of something, to set the priority and strive to obtain it. And yet uh, Paul put that uh, after a list of public gifts. And so he said, God has appointed in the church first apostle, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gift of healing, help, uh, administration, various kind of tongues. So here are the, uh, the uh, public gift, meaning the gift that is seen, uh, that uh, when people exercise this gift, they are known. Uh, and then he uh, uh, come back with a bunch of questions to say that you don't want, uh, I don't want you to focus on uh, uh, obtaining uh, public gift or desiring to be known in your ministry, in your service. So uh, he continue in verse 29 with a bunch of questions, are, are, are not apostles, are they? Are not prophets, are they? Are not teachers, are they? Are not workers of miracles, are they? Are, or do not have gifts of healing, do they? Or do not speak with tongues, do they? Or do not interpret, do they? So the answer is no. Uh, so uh, when, when Paul put it that way, but then he said, uh, eagerly desire the greater gift, we must understand what he wants to, to say. If we take the command as to seek uh, the greater public gift, uh, then Paul is telling the Corinthians to seek something they cannot have and pray uh, for something that only the Holy Spirit uh, uh, will uh, decide uh, sovereignly. And that is established for us in verse uh, 7, 11, and uh, 18, and verse, uh, on chapter 12 that we learned before, we just pointed out. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good, and all these are the work of one and the same Spirit he gives them to each one just as he determines. Uh, God has arranged uh, the parts in the body, uh, every one of them, just as he wants them to be, just as he desires. So, uh, so what kind of gift that you have uh, is not for you to ask. It's not for you to desire and go after and try to get this and try to get that. Uh, the, it's already established that he gives to, whatever, uh, to whoever he determined. At, uh, at whatever measure of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of faith and uh, of uh, resources as he determined. Uh, so when, when, when Paul said eagerly desired uh, greater gift, he has in mind the greater use of the gift that you already have. Uh, don't seek different public gifts to boast on yourself, but uh, yearn for the greater manifestation of the Holy Spirit in making you more effective better equipped and trained to use the gift already given to you uh, to do the utmost for the kingdom. So we are, we are encouraged and we are told uh, to seek greater use of the gift we have. And he said, I will show you how. I will show you how to get there, how to uh, be more effective. I will instruct you the most excellent way to make the most of your gift uh, for the function of the body to accomplish 
the common purpose and the mission of the church. Now, uh, if we take uh, the verb as indicative, then Paul is actually uh, um, voicing a concern uh, that, uh, that uh, but you still eagerly desire the greater public gift. So he makes a statement that uh, after I show you all this in the reality in, uh, in the church, that you still go in after public gift. But let me show you how the way give has to be done. Uh, so so uh, uh, with, with, with the same notion that he wants them to understand that uh, they have to connect with the love as the way to deal with uh, 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 the resources God gives the, to the church uh, for service. So the Corinthians are gifted, uh, and God has been gracious, uh, given them all that is required. They are not facing uh, uh, the lack of any gift in uh, chapter 1, verse 7. But because of their immaturity, uh, shall we say, the lack of love, the gifts God has given them have not manifested fully, have not functioned fully, and the church, gifted as it is, is now tottering at the brink of implosion of self-destruct due to disunity and internal strife. And I think that is a warning for, for uh, every church, and even our church at Anaheim here, that uh, we, uh, just like the Corinthians, do not lack any gift. We have resources, uh, we have the power of people, we have uh, the gift that God has given uh, to do the work that God has assigned to us to, uh, to do. But uh, what we suffer is uh, just like the, uh, the Corinthians and uh, every other church uh, in history, that it is a lack of love, it is a lack of uh, maturity in love, that the lack of people who develop uh, patience, kindness, uh, uh, and all the the quality of love that, uh, that Paul will list for us and teach us how because uh, we are not growing in, in there, we, uh, we will see a uh, uh, problem and issue popping up in our midst. So how do we uh, grow? How do we uh, um, mature? And, and we have to set up the proper context for our life. So one problem of the Corinthians, uh, like we mentioned, that they're seeking the wrong thing. They're seeking uh, 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 opportunity to serve, but serve in a way that uh, satisfy themselves, that uh, can be seen, that uh, can be uh, uh, considered as spiritual. And so the, uh, the, uh, the, the spectacular gift like healing and miracles uh, really, you know, desires for them to, to have. Uh, and that's why, you know, people say, let me have cancer and heal me and then so I can go and talk about the power that uh, you have displayed in me and, and that's what their prayer. Um, but, uh, but the Corinthians concentrate on, on uh, the gift uh, of, uh, of uh, healings and miracles but they are hard to manufacture because uh, if you want to uh, have miracles, uh, the gift of miracles, you have to do miracles and, and that's hard to do. Uh, so they concentrate on the one uh, gift that is left, which is the sign gift, which is speaking in tongues. So now they all flock into this uh, one gift that is speaking in tongues. So Paul is zeroing into that problem and he will explain uh, how to deal with that uh, uh, issue in chapter 14. Um, so uh, when, when you look at, the, at, at that flow, you can, uh, you can connect from uh, chapter 12 to chapter 14. Uh, very seamlessly. Uh, so in verse uh, 31, but earnestly desire the greater gift, and I will show you still an excellent way. Pursue love, uh, yet desire earnestly spiritual gift, but especially that you may prophesy. I just connect the last uh, verse of uh, uh, chapter 12 and to the first verse of chapter 14. So if just talking about spiritual gift, uh, you can just uh, skip uh, chapter 13, except to understand that Paul is now saying that if you don't get uh, the uh, substance of chapter 13, uh, there's no connection that you can move on. So Paul uh, proceeds to a very specific uh, instruction uh, to point out the prerequisite uh, that we must uh, have to live in the church, and that is love. Love has to be present and operating in the midst of the church uh, so that uh, each and every one of us must uh, function. 
Um, so when we say uh, love is uh, the prerequisite, um, is is uh, to to is to say that the love is uh, and uh, is not the gift that God gave to some people and not the rest, but He uh, is requiring uh, uh, in all the people uh, that belong to Him, because it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit that all believers uh, must show evident in their life. Galatians 5:22, the fruit of the Spirit is first love. So right right there, the, the first manifestation. Uh, of the spirit to control life, uh, spirit present in the life of God's people is love. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Just happen to be the same kind of same list in chapter uh, 13 from verse 4 to verse 7 that we will learn. So Paul is, is saying very simply, you know, it, it is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life manifesting uh, ma uh, 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 forming what is necessary for you to live in uh, in, in the church. Um, so it, it is a entire principle of life in uh, in Christ. Uh, so love is uh, the whole way of living. It is an overarching, all-embracing style of life that uh, transcends uh, all the uh, uh, gifts and uh, resources that God provides. Um, so that's why we say love is required for our function, because without love there is no function that works. If believers are members in the body and gifts are the functions for the members, then love is kind of like the blood in the body. Without the blood, the members cannot function. You know, have you ever slept on your arm and wake up in the middle of the night uh, panicking because your arm is like noodle? You, you can't move it. It's happened when the blood is cut off. Uh, it won't flow, so it's like that in the in the ministry, in the church. Love uh, linked to ministry. We will learn more of love, but we, it is sufficient uh, here to uh, note that love is defined in the context of ministry service and not independent of it. The two concepts, uh, love and ministry, are intrinsically linked. They are different and distinct, but they are linked and cannot be separated. We mentioned uh, the, the, the second component here is love is required for our mission. And I won't spend time much in that just to, to point out that, that, uh, that uh, the church is in place uh, in this time of history because God has a purpose to accomplish. And when the purpose is done and it is soon, uh, then the time of the church will be over. And that, uh, is, that means our time uh, will be over and we will be raptured away. You remember the lesson in the book of Revelation. We know that soon after the, the, the rapture of the church, there will be seven years of tribulation, of judgment, uh, to bring back the, uh, the nation of Israel into the plan of God. Then after the seven years of tribulation, Jesus will return, and that's the end of the world as we know it. So uh, what's happening from now to then is, uh, is that the church has to fulfill its mission we, before the, the time of the church is, 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 is done. And uh, we are given uh, that mission, uh, and in order to carry out that mission, we must understand, must develop love, uh, and live out that love in our midst. Um, so uh, look at uh, the love as identifying mark of the church. Uh, I think there's uh, plenty of uh, verses in, uh, in scripture. Let me just uh, list a few here. So that we, uh, we, we know that when Paul talked about love, um, it is uh, just talking about uh, a life uh, uh, in, in, in us. Uh, uh, it's that essential. Uh, so uh, uh, what is missing in Corinth uh, is also missing in uh, Anaheim. And uh, what uh, is the uh, offer? Uh, uh, instructed to uh, the church in Corinth to correct uh, is also the path that we need to take. So love is uh, the identity and mark of the church. Uh, uh, in John 13, uh, Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So very uh, clear, very simple. How do people know that, you are, uh, that we are the Christ's disciple? Uh, Jesus says, uh, point them to the love that you have for one another. 
So uh, how, how do people know that the church belongs to Christ? And they should uh, see the love that is in the church. So love is identified mark of those who belong to Christ. And uh, so uh, when we say uh, uh, point to the love of the church and people say, oh, I don't see any love of the church. Well, best way to, to see the church is to look into the mirror. Uh, that's, that's the way uh, we see the church and that we see ourselves and our connection and our contribution and our reality uh, as reflected in the church. Uh, so in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 1 to 2, uh, <clears throat> now talking about how we live, uh, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved, uh, dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved you and gave himself up for us as a fragrance of offering and sacrifice to God. So how do we live? We live a life of love just as Christ loved us uh, as uh, the fragrance of offering and sacrifice to God. Uh, we are told uh, that is the way we ought to love, that when, uh, when uh, in connection to us, people will uh, see a fragrance of offering uh, to God that, uh, that impacted uh, their life and bring them to, to, uh, to the understanding of God. In, in, Col in Colossians chapter 3, uh, Paul explained that, uh, that love is uh, the, uh, the, the lifestyle Love is the whole approach uh, to, to life. Love is the principle of living. It is not something uh, that we do, uh, but it is uh, the life that we live. Uh, it, it is a worldview, it's a core value, um, and it is something that, uh, that, uh, uh, that we need to manifest. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds uh, them all together in perfect unity. So we, uh, we will look at the components of, of love, uh, which we will uh, delve into in the next few weeks. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. Uh, so uh, all the channel that love may flow into our life, it's actually uh, uh, very available uh, in the way that we uh, need love to serve. So uh, just, to, uh, you know, just to hint of how that will work. So uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first definition of love is love is patient. Now, how do you uh, get to be loving? Well, you get to be loving to, uh, to that you be uh, patient people. How do you get patient? Well, it doesn't come uh, by, you know, having uh, ease in our life and, and uh, you know, things uh, go according to what you wish, what you want. And so he, uh, God said, I will develop you to be loving people by putting you next to a difficult guy in the church, put you in a difficult situation in the team, uh, facing challenges that you cannot solve by yourself. Why? Because I want you to be like me more patient. Uh, I mean, just to think about that, uh, if, if you don't connect to the service, you don't do connect uh, to the work, you do not connect to the people, uh, it's hard to develop the quality of patience in our life. So uh, as we go through the list, we will see that, uh, therefore, uh, the church uh, is defined as, uh, as an environment where, where these things are developed and manifest and show us uh, up to be more like Christ. And so uh, what enables us to forgive, enables us to have hope, enables us to endure, uh, that is uh, transforming our heart to be loving people. So love is required for each member uh, in the church to function. It's required for the whole body to function. It's the governing principle of, uh, of, the, of the body uh, of, of Christ in the church. And uh, uh, it is uh, like the law and constitution uh, of, uh, of the body of Christ because uh, uh, we say law and constitution because uh, uh, love sum up all the law and the prophets as Christ said. Um, <clears throat> so uh, so we, we, we note that uh, <clears throat> we note that as we look into the details. So I just want to introduce uh, the, uh, the, uh, the first uh, three uh, verses in chapter 13, 
we won't have time to go deeper into that, but at least the, the concept is there for us to uh, think about. So uh, Paul, after uh, making the, the, the connection, he said, I earnestly desire the greater gift, and I shall use still more an excellent way. Um, and he now moved into understanding of love, and he pointed out that this uh, indispensability uh, of love in the ministry. So uh, we um, move into uh, here, and uh, this is how we open up the, the chapter uh, that is so well known. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a gift of prophecy and know, and know all the mystery and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I, ha if I give all my possession to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Uh, so um, the, the word that Paul used here is agape. Uh, most of us understand that, uh, that word and uh, how it is used. Uh, it is one of the, uh, actually uh, one of the rare, uh, most rare words in, uh, in Greek literature. It's only found a few times uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the, the ancient Greek literature, but it's one of the most common in the New Testament. It's actually uh, used 116 times altogether in the New Testament and 70 times by Paul. So Paul makes uh, this a, a, a very prominent feature in the life of the church and the goal of the church and the function of the church. Uh, 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 so uh, the, 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 the word agape uh, is never used in the connection to romantic love. Um, it's it talking about the kind of love that uh, not about uh, sentimental uh, connection, not about feeling good or something about someone, uh, not in, in casual way when we say I love ice cream or I love your hair. Uh, you, you cannot use this word for those things. Uh, and it does not even mean the close friendship or brotherly love uh, because that is another word, philia for that. Uh, 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 the, the, uh, the word agape is not, uh, does, not, does not mean charity, uh, like helping someone uh, meet somebody's need. Um, so what is agape then? Well, Paul take the whole chapter to define agape, uh, and we need to understand agape in that way. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we, 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 we can note that, that it is the love that is manifest at the cross of Christ. The cross shows a love that is utterly unworthy, the love that proceeds from God uh, to uh, the, who is love, but to those who uh, have no, uh, no claim on love, is not worthy uh, uh, of, of that love. It's a love that comes from the nature and the heart of God, uh, the one who loves. Uh, uh, not the one who received love or any attractiveness uh, from, the, from the receiver. So here we set up love in, in the context of grace um, uh, because it is uh, the kind of love that flows uh, one way from the, from the source to the, to the receiver, which uh, cannot uh, return, um, can only reflect. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the Christian is one who experiences God's love and he is so changed and transformed that he begins to love in the same way. Uh, he will reflect that love because he is now full of it that is now uh, overwhelming in him uh, and is uh, transforming in him. And so he begins to see people the way God sees them. He begins to practice the love that uh, seeks nothing for itself but uh, only for the good uh, of the ones who is loved. So, uh, so this is the love that Paul is now saying that uh, we must learn and we must understand that it is indispensable uh, for uh, the work uh, that uh, God has assigned to us in the church. Um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, we, we want to uh, understand this because uh, it's not talking about the cozy feeling that we have 
uh, or the, the, the uh, Kumbaya fellowship that uh, we share when we sing song together or we cry together or we pray together or we just feel a, a common connection. Now all that is good. I mean, uh, we need uh, all those things. But uh, very often we mistake the, them as love. The, the feeling of love is very hard. I mean, talking about patience, uh, nobody likes the feeling of, of, of patience. You know, to, to be patient means to be in pain, to be under pressure, to be extended out to the, to, uh, to the limits that you don't feel comfortable with. But that is the feeling of love. That's how love feels. Love feels that kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of pressure, of, uh, of uh, uh, pain, of uh, the suffering. Uh, so, so uh, we want to uh, uh, to uh, make connection to how to develop that in in our life. So the 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 the, the, the first area that Paul want to uh, for us to understand is is the indif- indefensibility of love in ministry. So he said that without love our words mean nothing. Without love our knowledge means nothing. Without love our works mean nothing. And and uh, 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 how do we visualize uh, the, 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 the this kind of love that works in us? Um, well, we 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 hear uh, you know com- comparison like love is kind of like the hand to help others, love is like the feet to go to uh, where the needs are, uh, love is like uh, eyes to see the misery and uh, and the want of people. Ears to hear the the sorrow uh, and 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 understand the tears of people. It's all very helpful, but uh, but uh, the, the way Paul put it is uh, right in the heart that we must understand. So so he said, if I speak in the tongues of man or of angel, but uh, I have not love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. Uh, let, let, let's just focus first of all in what we say. Without love, our words mean nothing. With, with, uh, without love, all that we say mean nothing. And, and, and what Paul is uh, telling us here is, is, is not just the casual conversation that we say. Um, he's, he's talking about the best that uh, we as uh, people can say. Uh, the, the most eloquent, the most powerful, the most uh, um, uh, uh, gifted, uh, the, the most uh, profound content. Uh, if I speak in the tongues of man and of angel, uh, but I have not love, then I am only a resounding gong or clean and simple. So we note Paul used the first personal pronoun here as I. Uh, so he does this to identify with the Corinthians of his own need uh, for this love. So this is uh, very significant as Paul uh, talked to the, to the people in the church, and they've been on the receiving end uh, of his instruction that uh, he has been pointing out to them uh, the issues of, the, of their life and their relationship, where they need to correct, where they need to change. Um, uh, but now when pointing point out the essential of uh, how to make a uh, change, how to live it out, Paul put himself together with the people. And he said this principle of love governs his own thinking as well. He is not beyond it. It's not the lesson just to teach people. It's the life to live, and he is under obligation, just like anybody else. Um, so it's to point out the sensitive uh, character of Paul in dealing with the church. Paul does not demand anything from anyone that he is not uh, willing to first do. So I want just to pause on this and, 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 and to say it is the first step in connection to the church. Because when we're talking about lacking in the church, uh, the first thing we see is the lack in the people uh, in other people, when we say uh, this church is not uh, spiritual, this church is not uh, loving, we have somebody else in mind. We have some problem that we see. Uh, we have some complaint that we want to voice. Paul said, uh, wait a minute, if I speak the tongue of man of Rancho, but if I have not love, then I am only a resounding gong, a going and simple. So Paul start with himself. Uh, when, when, we, when he said to, to measure the operation of love, the reality of love, I don't start with the pastor, I don't start with the leaders, I don't start with uh, somebody else, I start with myself. I start with the, uh, the understanding that it applies to me, 
because uh, we, we can learn all this uh, and apply to somebody else and maybe that's how we've been doing so that we learn the lesson for somebody else and therefore nobody learn anything and nobody change uh, so Paul start with the I uh, that uh, I need to understand this I need to start with this I need to uh, look into the mirror and ask God uh, to instruct me and help me to be loving as he want to be. So I just want to stop there now so we don't just go into uh, halfway in. But let's just start with that and say, if I understand the context of love in the church, if I understand the, the, the fact that love is required for me to function as a, a, as a, as a Christian, as a one saved by grace, uh, in relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. If I uh, are to be true to my pledge to Christ when I hold the bread and the cup in my hand and say, I shall live for you, I will declare your death until uh, you return. And then I realize I cannot do that without love. And I cannot do that independent of the church. I cannot do that without a connection to members of the church family in the local church. I cannot do it right now, right here, then I cannot do it anywhere else. So let's, uh, let, let's begin with that in the context of love in the church. Where do we put the eye in connection to? And how do we uh, pray so that God can begin to make us not just nice people, but loving people in reflection of Christ? God, do your work in us in mercy and in grace with the power of the Holy Spirit and the things that we cannot do ourselves. But we are so grateful, Lord, that you are the God who transforms. And you transform with the love in your heart by flowing into us the overwhelming grace and mercy of that love so that we can reflect your likeness in us as we follow the power, transformation, the change that brought by the Holy Spirit in your truth. Do it today. Help us to take the next step following you, living for you, in grace and mercy for your name's sake, and in love. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.